digitalization, globalization, technological advancement, that complex media landscape that we're all challenged with today. All of this requires of us an increase in speed, in transparency, and a demand to continuously innovate and to change. All of this means we cannot continue to do things the way we always did them. We cannot continue to make decisions in closed boardrooms, often with the help of historic data, old data, like sales statistics and customer surveys. And then when we made that decision, we delegate communication to someone else to communicate about it. That used to work in the old world, in the slow world, in an unconnected world. Today, we need to take communication. We need to lift it into our decision forums. We need to be listening, engaging, and driving continuous innovation and change through those digital platforms that we're all on today. Good evening, everyone. My name's Karen, and I have about 20 years of experience in driving change in various organizations. And I can't wait to share with you how you build that organization prepared for tomorrow. Because tomorrow is coming, and it's coming fast. Technology is developing exponentially. And we're all starting to realize that we're going to be swapped. We are going to be replaced by machines. It's scary, but it's true. If we look here and now, I am sure that you guys are all active on these platforms in various ways. And you're using them both for work and for play, right? I mean, you are standing in your kitchen, you're cooking dinner, and you're checking your emails on the same time. Then you tell yourself, oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gonna work now. So you take away that email, but then you go over to Facebook, and there are your colleagues, and you have your work-related groups, and you maybe have your social internet. So the lines are being blurred between what's professional and what's private. Still, we are traditionally organized in hierarchies. We love our hierarchies because we know who's the leader. We have our targets, we have our teams. It's easy. But technology allows for us to collaborate seamlessly in networks. And we do, and we challenge hierarchies through this, this technological way of communicating that we're doing today. But we cling on to our hierarchies. And unfortunately, these hierarchies lead to silos. And they even sometimes we even have conflicting targets. So we compete with each other internally. They lead to stress, frustration, and a lack of collaboration. Another thing that these digital tools do for us is this. I'm sure you can relate to this scenario. We're all sort of still connected together sitting and watching a big screen, but we're not watching. We're just sitting in front of it because we're deeply into our own personal networking. And guess what? We hate ads. How many of you guys now, seriously, how many of you are ad blocking? Yeah, <laughs> you're an advanced audience. <laughs> Approximately 30% of us are ad blocking today. So ad blocking being the plugin that allows you to skip ads. I mean, the fact that we are ad blocking is just a very clear signal. Don't disturb me when I'm networking. Don't disturb me with that old way of communication, right? Um, let's talk about trust a little bit. Do you trust what you see online? Do you trust what you read? I'm happy. You are an advanced audience. You're shaking your heads. That's good. The thing is, fake is here. Fake is for real. I'm sure that you have heard about fake video. The University of Washington pr produced fake video, uh, one of Obama, and it's absolutely impossible to see the difference between the real Obama and the fake one. So all of this is happening right now, and it's having effect on our trust. So this is a little bit from a lovely survey called Edelman Trust Barometer. It comes out yearly. It's a global survey, and it measures our trust in media. And we have never had such a low level of trust in media as we do today. We worry about fake news, and that's a good thing. Of course, it's a great thing. But it's also sad, because the traditional sort of power shift is gone in terms of media. We also consume media from traditional news outlets 
more and more seldomly. Because what we do is we share our view of the world is being curated by the networks that we are in and what's being shared with us from our friends. So I've painted you a pretty grim picture of the world right now. Um, how are we going to handle this? How are we going to tackle this? I suggest we have a look at those who know exactly what to do, those who are grown up in this world now and those who can navigate this landscape. It's the 12 year olds. Let's have a look at the 12 year olds. This is mine and her friends. Um, they are superstars at communicating and networking and they don't even know it. I'm sure that many of you have struggled with uh, some sort of dance move lately, like this one or that one. I'm very proud that I got it. Um, we can try that in the break later on. Um, but the funny thing is you can take a 12 year old from one country and a 12 year old from another country and put them together and they are into exactly the same trends because the tr trends just sort of spread like that. Slime is a horrible trend for every parent out there because what the kids do is they take daddy's shaving cream, they take contact lens fluid, they take glue, and then they mix it all together to, to showcase these beautiful slime things that they have on Instagram. What they do, you're thinking, why is she talking about slime? But the thing is, these kids are mini entrepreneurs because they're buying and selling stuff from each other, using the platforms the way they're supposed to be used. So what they do also is they listen to all the trends that's, that are coming and they're changing their product offering the whole time through a transparent dialogue with their followers and with their friends. They are communicative superstars without knowing it because they're born into this world and this way of networking. So as a business, how do we go about doing this? Well, we have to realize first and foremost that we have to change. And that is the hard one, because we have a lot of money vested in the past, right? We don't really want to listen to all that feedback that comes from the outside world. But we have to, and we have to realize that we have to drive change. And the first and most foremost important thing that you need to have in place if you're going to drive change is trust. Because if you have an organization where there are anxieties, worries, if you're afraid to fail, afraid to be punished in the organization, if you have that, nothing's going to happen. No one is going to change one little bit. We stagnate. So you have to manage for trust. There's been lots of good research done on this topic. I love the research done by Paul J. Zak, and uh, he found in his research that if you have a high level of trust in an organization, you have higher levels of productivity, you have people who are engaged, and really loving their job, you have lower levels of stress, lower levels of burnout. And to give you three tips on how to manage for trust, the first one is recognize excellence. Tell people when they do a good job or they behave in a good way and tell them so that everyone can hear, so that it's really, really clear to everyone, not just one-to-one. -one. And the second one, Managing for trust is not about sitting in a ring, holding hands, drinking tea. We can do that too, but we need to have challenging goals. So induced challenged stress or giving people challenging targets is a way of telling them that I trust that you can reach this goal. I trust you, you can do it. And obviously we don't micromanage people because when you micromanage someone, you tell them, I don't really trust that you can do your job, so I'll help you do it. The third one, and the most important one in a connected world, is to open up and show vulnerability. Because there's so much insecurity, there's so much uncertainty, there's so many questions in our world today. So we need to have people who can try and who can fail. So we need to foster a culture where failing is okay. And as a leader, you need to be the one stepping up and talking about failures. I know how hard that is but you need to do that. When you have a high level of trust, the second step that you need to be doing is getting everyone on board on this change and making them feel a part of it and a part of that we're on the same track. And this is about clarifying your purpose. You all have a mission and you all have a vision, I know that. But is it engaging enough for people to wake up at 2 a.m. in the morning and go, oh my god, I'm going to work and it's so much fun. You need to have a purpose 
that is worth the talk. And so it's not just that boring vision and mission. You have to change that into something that engages people, employees, and customers. And the third one is, and this is extra important, in an emotionally driven media landscape, our values. Our values need to be super clear in terms of how we go about doing our business. What is right and what is wrong? The thing with values is that we often have really nice words on the wall, right? But we don't live those values. So these values need to be truly lived by. You need to visualize them in your everyday life. When you have this in place, a high level of trust in the organization, a purpose that we all are buying into and that we love, and clarity on the values, then we can start talking about communicative leaders and employees. And there's lots of communicative leaders out there, and they're often very good at the company meeting maybe on emails or intranets, but there are so few communicative leaders who understand digital. It really frustrates me. What is this? So we have to look outside of uh, where we are today. We look to the West. There's a CEO uh, of a company called T-Mobile. Uh, his name is John Legier, and he's absolutely amazing on Facebook. What he does is on Sunday nights, he invites everyone on Slow Cookers Sunday. So um, he does a Facebook Live um, on, from his kitchen, and then he engages all his employees, all his customers, his com competitors, and he's talking about you know, the telco industry, product development, all of these things. I mean, he gets thousands and thousands of people engaging in his slow cookers Sunday uh, live streams on Facebook. Amazing. Another one is from Norway. We know this guy, it's uh, Petter Stordalen, and he's amazing on Instagram. What he does is his, he shares with us his very sort of personal uh, life, like when he's doing gym, or he's in the gym with a dog on his back, or he's out running in the woods, or he's with his wife, but he also shares the professional parts. So he's, he's excellent at balancing the personal with the professional, and he manages to engage us all in that. So three tips if you want to become a communi communicative leader. The first one is you need, just like you do as a company or an organization, you need to be clear about who you are and what you stand for. So you also have to have a purpose. Why do we want to follow you? Be clear on that. Think about that. Set clear goals. So you need to have goals because these goals, why are you doing this? They direct which platforms you want to be on, because there are thousands of platforms out there. You can't be everywhere. So if you want to engage with your customers and you're in B2B, maybe LinkedIn is the way to go. If you want to engage with your, uh, your employees, maybe you want to have a look at your social intranet, etc. So the final one is the hard one. And this is all about taking the time to engage, having a small mouth, big ears, listening to what's happening in your network and engaging. And the most important part here is obviously to be yourself. <laughs> be, I mean, authentic is a word that's kind of used a lot, but you need to be yourself because that's what we want. We want to get to know you, not your professional surface you, just you. If we get that, we can manage to have employees who do the same. There's some companies who have employees who are super active on social. Um, one example is Spotify. If you follow the hashtag life at Spotify on Instagram, you can see employees at Spotify sharing their everyday life at Spotify. And it's super engaging to see. It's, it's one of those things that I think you can skip all kinds of employer branding initiatives and try to get this happening instead because this is the strongest employer branding tool there is out there. The problem with this one is you can't demand it. This is something you earn. If you manage to do all the other things right, you might earn space in your employees' social media channels, but it's hard. Not that many do it. Once we get there, we can do something which I call crowdsourced product development, but that's just a fancy word for what the 12-year-olds do, that is, really actively taking in the feedback from the outside world and lifting it into our product development. Some companies do that well. NASA, for example, they have a site called Solve, 
where you can help NASA solve their really challenging technical issues that they have. I'm going to sum this up in a very basic model that you've all seen. But I love this model because it makes it, it, it shows how you have to start from the bottom before you reach the top. It's the Maslow hierarchy of need. And it shows how you cannot get to the top if you don't have the basics in place. And if you translate that to communicative leadership, we need that basic layer of trust in the organization. And we need to get everyone to feel a part of the journey through a clarified purpose and values. And then we have our communicative leaders and employees who, who can enable crowdsourced product development where we can reach a state of continuous innovation. So just like the 12 year olds on Instagram, keep your customers close and your competitors far away. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>